Hello. First, I want to thank the BMW Foundation and Responsible Leaders Network for offering this space to discuss the pressing social issue of migration. My name is Victoria Sanford. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. I'm an anthropologist, writer, and human rights advocate. The title of today's masterclass is New Directions for International Migration Policies. Just as Europe confronts new waves of migrants from the Middle East and North Africa, the United States faces increasing waves of migration from Central America at its southern border with Mexico. Migration has become a defining political and humanitarian issue domestically and internationally for the United States and the European Union. While my remarks in this masterclass focus on Central American migration to the US, I believe there are lessons to be learned more broadly about international migration from this case study. Recognizing citizen insecurity and poverty as migration drivers, the Biden administration has set for itself the challenge of addressing the root causes of migration from Central America to the US in tandem with border enforcement from Honduras through Guatemala and Mexico to the US border. Immigration policy is the domestic expression of foreign policy, and both need serious overhauls to tackle the ongoing humanitarian disaster on both sides of the US-Mexico border, as well as the criminality, corruption, and impunity of private and state actors in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. But the US must carefully choose its institutional and lead regional partners in this quest. The United States is increasing precarity and militarizing Mexico and Central America in its latest stopgap agreement, ostensibly to stem the flow of Central American refugees by using proxy Mexican and Central American troops on their shared borders. On April 12th, the Biden administration announced the deployment of 10,000 Mexican troops on its border with Guatemala, 1,500 Guatemalan troops on its border with Honduras, and a surge of 7,000 police and troops within Honduras. On her first international trip to Guatemala and Mexico in early June, Vice President Kamala Harris told Central Americans not to make the dangerous trek to the U.S. She said, do not come. I believe you will be turned back. Three months earlier, White House lead advisor on the border, Roberta Jacobson, visited Mexico and announced, echoing her boss, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, don't come to the border. The border is closed. At that same time, the US ratified an agreement for $530,000 in U.S. assistance to Guatemalan President Alejandro Yamate's presidential commission against, against corruption. Within one week of the March 23rd signing of this bilateral agreement, Yamate suspended Guatemalan rights to freedom of assembly in an emergency decree restricting open air gatherings and demonstrations in five departments near the Honduran border. Following a similar decree in January, Guatemalan police and army soldiers attacked a group of Honduran families with tear gas and batons at a border checkpoint. On March 30th, some 300 exasperated Mexican and Guatemalan citizens in the border town of La Esperanza responded to a Mexican soldier killing a Guatemalan at a checkpoint by capturing and detaining 15 Mexican soldiers, three vehicles, and 17 guns. This killing of a Guatemalan by a Mexican soldier serving in what has effectively become surrogate immigration enforcement for the US came little more than two weeks after the repatriation of 13 Guatemalans killed and burned by Mexican police in the Mexican state of Tamaulipas near the US border in January. Proxy state violence on borders, precarious engineered routing of migrants through inhospitable desert, unpredictable internal frontiers of gang and cartel territory, and official US pronouncements of border closures 
have not stopped the flow of Central American refugees seeking safe haven from gruesome, brutal violence and corruption at all levels of Central American governments. Following an April virtual bilateral meeting with Guatemalan President Alejandro Yamate, Vice President Kamala Harris announced a $310 million humanitarian aid package to Central America. And Guatemalan Foreign Minister Pedro Brollo announced an agreement with the US to establish a new joint border protection task force that would include 16 US Department of Homeland Security officials. Like the March 2021 contribution to Yamate's Personal Corruption Commission, more aid to the Yamate government will not slow the exodus of Guatemalans or make a dent in the struggle against corruption. Indeed, in August 2010, Yamate was arrested and held in preventive detention for his role as National Prison Director in the 2006 Pavon Prison Massacre, categorized as a series of planned extrajudicial executions by the UN-backed International Commission Against Impunity. In 2007, Yamate was a presidential candidate running on a law and order platform promoting the massacre of his, quote, successful retaking of the prison from a criminal network. This was his argument for grounds for his presidency. He placed third in the race. Yamate declared himself a political prisoner during his 2010 detention. In May of 2011, charges were dropped and the case was closed due to lack of evidence. That same year, and again in 2015, he again ran unsuccessful presidential campaigns. On his fourth attempt, Yamate won the 2019 presidential election after the leading candidate, former Attorney General and anti-corruption crusader, Belma Aldana, was driven into exile. In February 2021, Aldana posted, I am afraid of going back to Guatemala and being killed on hashtag Tengo Miedo, hashtag I am afraid, the Guatemalan Twitter campaign against gender violence. Granted political asylum in the U.S., Aldana joins her predecessor in exile, former Attorney General Claudia Paz y Paz, who led successful anti-corruption cases, as well as convictions of army officers involved in the genocide of the 1980s. Like Aldana, Paz y Paz had worked closely with the UN Commission Against Impunity to prosecute corruption and impunity in Guatemalan courts. Yamate claims Guatemala no longer needs this international presence for prosecutors to safely do their jobs. But if this were true, the two top corruption fighters, Aldana and Pazi Paz, would not be in exile, and the current attorney general would not be using the power of her office to file specious charges against the very prosecutor's unit meant to investigate corruption. Most recently, anti-corruption crusader and elected judge Gloria Portas was denied her seat on the constitutional court by a murky legal challenge, stripping the court of its independence and leaving judges vulnerable to the whims of the powerful. Refugees exist because of violence and insecurity in their home countries. Migrant caravans of refugees exist because of the ferocity of legal and illegal armed groups controlling the route of the journey. Knowing they will confront gangs, cartels, corrupt straight officers, and crooks along the way, refugees seek safety in numbers. Yet even these caravans are no guarantee of safety because refugees must entrust their lives in transit to unscrupulous traffickers who are able to move through borders because of corruption and ties to official and unofficial networks. In November 2018, two trucks from a caravan were sequestered and disappeared in Veracruz, Mexico. One survivor of the mass abduction recounted that some 65 children and seven women were sold to armed men by the driver. These women and children are among the more than 70,000 Central Americans who have gone missing in Mexico in the past decade. 
For Americans wondering why parents would send their children to the border or why families would travel together to reach the US border, the conditions confronted by these refugees crossing Mexico must be even more perplexing. In addition to the hunger and thirst of the trip north, Doctors Without Borders reported 57% of Central Americans suffered violence crossing through Mexico, and 75% of people traveling with children fled violence in their home country. This violence in flight is not new. Of the numerous Central American women I have interviewed about crossing the border in the 1980s and 1990s before the caravans existed, only two were not raped. So what is the cause of the decades long exodus and why do Central Americans risk such lethal violence? My research on Central America over the past 30 years is my lens for understanding how we reached this turning point. The Cold War, the 1950s to 1990s, the war on drugs, the 1990s to the present, and the comparatively weak support proffered by the US to Central American transitional justice initiatives since the 1990s primed Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras to become states of impunity with little regard for basic human rights and even less for the majority poor. Though internal hostilities officially ceased when peace accords followed by truth commissions were brokered by the United Nations in Guatemala and El Salvador in the 1990s, the structures of violence and inequality have never been dismantled because the recommendations of both peace accords and truth commissions lacked any enforcement mechanisms. While some Guatemalan military officers have been convicted for the genocide and crimes against humanity committed in the 1980s, others have successfully transitioned their political structures into political parties, capturing much of the power of the state. Indeed, a high-ranking Guatemalan officer involved in peace negotiations told me in 1994 that the content of the peace accords was irrelevant because, quote, we, the army, have the most organization, so we win. Predatory elites who long utilized the military and police to maintain their economic power easily adapted to playing the civilian front for predominantly military parties while also adjusting to the new economic power of drug cartels financing politicians and their relations with police and judicial officers. Like former and current army and police officials, elites have cut deals with and benefited from the clandestine structures and financial backing of organized crime and drug cartels. This hornet's nest of collusion has made daily life a constant struggle for survival for the majority of Guatemalans with an impunity rate for criminality hovering over 90% and impunity for women staying steady at 98%. April was hashtag genocide awareness month. Guatemala continues to live with the legacies of the 1980s genocide that left 626 villages burned to the ground, displaced 1.5 million Guatemalans, disappeared 50,000 people, and killed 200,000. The majority Maya who continue to live in poverty were the majority of these victims as well. The Guatemalan army responsible for 93% of these atrocities targeted Maya communities and the military government's conceptualization of anti-government guerrillas became synonymous with indigenous Guatemalans. The government developed a preemptive strategy and engaged in a scorched earth campaign during which they systematically burned, tortured, raped, and terrorized into submission Guatemala's Mayan population. This preemptive genocide was carried out to prevent the possibility of dissent and social revolution. The fluidity of public and clandestine relationships between the legal, illegal, and extra-legal activities of government bureaucracies can also be traced through the arrests of government officials charged with drug trafficking and acts of corruption. 
President Yamate's Anti-Corruption Commission is the latest in a long trail of presidential Ponzi schemes. Former President Otto Perez Molina, a former general who was accused of genocide while commander in the Ischil Maya area in 1982, rose to the presidency in 2012, only to fall in a corruption scandal of epic proportions in 2015, wherein he utilized the office of the presidency to establish his own import tax system. Known to those who called as La Linea, the line, it was parallel to the actual government system, raking in up to $10 million a month in illicit taxes. Back in 2009, one day after the United States Department of State identified Guatemala as the epicenter of the drug threat in its 2009 annual narcotics report, Baltasar Gomez, director of the National Police, and Nelly Bonilla, commander of the police anti-narcotics unit, were arrested on drug charges. The previous police director, Porfirio Perez, was arrested for stealing cocaine and cash in August 2009. While well, these arrests confirmed the entrenchment of drug trafficking interests within the highest ranks of the police, it did not end official collusion. Indeed, in April 2018, there was a raid and in it, an army colonel and a police commander were both arrested as gang leaders of the Marta Salvatrucha, the MS-13, and their networks extended out to Guatemala City, and the departments of San Marcos, Escuintla, Quetzaltenango, Jutiapa, Zacapa, Chimaltenango, Suchitepeques, Totonicapan, Chiquimula, Huehuetenango, and Quiche. The problem is that these arrests do not end the gangs. Others will take over their leadership within the MS-13 and the Marta Dieciocho. The Marta Dieciocho will use the vacuum of leadership to seize further control of the country. These violent groups constitute a structure of parallel powers in Guatemala, which has continued to dominate the country now, just as it did 10 years ago and during La Violencia. These parallel powers form a part of an interlocking structure of violence that influences the country a great deal. Former generals and other high-ranking officials from the late 20th century dictatorships have taken on roles in the 21st century civilian government and through political parties. Others are involved in drug trafficking or high-level organized crime, and none of these activities are mutually exclusive. All of the elements of the parallel structure interlock with one another in vertical as well as horizontal relationships. For instance, the gangs make payments to the police so that the police don't interfere with their operations in their territories. Those payments flow upwards. The local police officers have to pay a certain amount of money to their boss, who in turn has to pay off his boss. And then at the higher levels, there are the drug traffickers who might buy the services of someone much more senior in the police, who might then send some of the payments downwards to individual officers. At the same time, the narco traffickers and organized crime syndicates are often paying off local gang members for doing contract jobs to support illicit trafficking and existing power structures. These jobs range from violent work as hitmen, kidnappers, extortionists, arsonists, and carjackers to the recruitment of low-level traffickers and other support networks for narco traffickers and organized crime. In short, these are not informal local arrangements. They are extensive structures of violence, bribes, threats, racketeering, and patronage. These parallel powers are so strong that the International Commission Against Impunity, CICIG, was established by the United Nations and the Congress of Guatemala with the hope of reigning in these powers through investigation and prosecution. CICIG was established through an agreement first signed by the United Nations and the government of Guatemala in 2006 that was subsequently ratified by the Congress of Guatemala in August of 2007. This was no small feat. Previous efforts had been thwarted by the Guatemalan Congress on the grounds that such investigative bodies violated the sovereignty of Guatemala. 
Ironically, the first permutation of CICIG was voted down by the Guatemalan Congress on grounds of sovereignty just days before the same Congress voted in favor of the Central American Free Trade Agreement, CAFTA, which effectively suborns the constitution of Guatemala to CAFTA. Though lacking the teeth of the original commission, which would have had prosecutorial power, CICIG was established to support and assist the Public Prosecutor's Office, the National Civil Police, and other state institutions in the investigation and development of criminal prosecutions of illegal security groups and clandestine security structures with the goal of disbanding these dangerous shadow alliances. The police and President Yamate's penitentiary system, when he was the director of the penitentiary, were among the key institutions identified as priority targets for CICIG investigations when it began its mandate in 2007. A core belief of the CICIG process is that by supporting Guatemalan agencies in the investigation and prosecution of illegal clandestine structures, the judicial system is also strengthened and empowered to carry forth prosecutorial efforts against illegal clandestine groups and their shadowy backers. Since its initial authorization for two years in 2007, its mandate was renewed in 2009, 2011, 2013, 15, and again in 2017. While disliked by the powerful and corrupt, CICIG had a 75% approval rating in Guatemala. CICIG contributed to a reduction in homicides and an increase in prosecutions. Working with Guatemalan prosecutors, more than 70 criminal networks were dismantled. 100 high impact cases were investigated and prosecuted. 600 suspects were brought to trial and 400 were convicted. In six years, $30 million, 158 vehicles, and 86 properties stolen from the government were recovered. Perez Molina's La Linea was estimated to have diverted $120 million from customs coffers, which formed a part of the $535 million lost to corruption in 2015. The indictment of Perez Molina and two other presidents, a Supreme Court judge, political operatives, and ministry officials revealed the complex structures that tie elected officials to security structures, cartels, organized crime, and the private sector. Guatemalans overwhelmingly supported CICIG because it offered a glimpse of the rule of law as it broke the chokehold of clandestine organizations and grifters who held the state captive. While Guatemalan migration spiked during the first two years of Perez Molina's crooked regime, the number of Guatemalans at the US border decreased by 29% when Perez Molina was arrested on corruption charges in 2015. Gangs, cartels, and organized crime are transnational criminal organizations that have captured governments and hobbled nascent democracies in Central America. As the powerful and corrupt ramped up unrelenting attacks on CICIG and the previous US administration was silent, then President Jimmy Morales, who was himself under investigation, did not renew CICIG's mandate in 2019 and a record 264,168 Guatemalans were caught on the US border. If you follow the money, trafficking in organized crime implicates transnational criminal actors, but it also implicates failed US government policies and inadequate support for regional and international efforts to combat corruption and impunity. The US government provided an average of $4 million annually to CICIG over 12 years, a paltry sum compared to the $60 million per week now being spent to shelter unaccompanied minors at the US-Mexico border, 
or to the one to $2 million of daily US military aid sent to El Salvador at the height of the counterinsurgency war during the Carter and Reagan administrations. Corruption is the source of increasing inequality, diminished life possibilities, hunger and violence that drive migration. The daily killing of women, gang violence, disappearances, attacks on journalists, threats to human rights activists, environmental destruction of Maya communities by international mining companies, drought in rural villages, exacerbating water shortages caused by re-engineering of water sources to serve corporate farming interests, lack of access to basic health and human services, and general corruption in all levels of the government are among the drivers of inequality, hopelessness, and migration. The roots of travel are controlled by the very gangs and organized crime that have come to dominate drug trafficking to the US and arms trafficking back to Mexico and Central America. Central American refugees are fleeing violence in all its forms to find safety. This is not seasonal migration. The thousands of children at the border are not a sudden border crisis. They are a migration foretold by cycles of inequality, exclusion, and corruption reinforced by Central American governments. The majority of Americans do not want to see families separated or children warehoused in cages. All children deserve to be treated with dignity and love. The U.S. needs to reimagine its immigration system and needs to reimagine its regional relationship with Central Americans and their governments. The U.S. must send a message to the people of Central America that the United States is as committed to fighting corruption as it is to stemming the flow of children in flight from violence and poverty. Support for further militarization of the borders by the very security forces implicated in criminal activity of clandestine groups will only heighten the dead count and the number of Central Americans fleeing their countries. Whether attorneys general seeking to prosecute corruption or regular citizens trying to take a bus to work without having to pay a tax to the local gang, Rule of law is essential for Guatemalan society to give its citizens a measure of security. Corruption drives legal and illegal migration because it collapses public space and civic possibility. Migration from Guatemala went down 35% during CICIG's first year of anti-corruption work in Guatemala. For five years, the number of Guatemalans apprehended at the U.S. border continued to drop. Sisig's successes are a model for the region to follow in the ongoing fight against corruption. The U.S.-backed Cold War in Central America in the 1980s propped up corrupt military regimes and predatory elites as brutal proxy forces turned on their own people, killing 200,000 in Guatemala, 75,000 in El Salvador, and a still untallied number of disappearances and killings in Honduras. These late 20th century wars are the underlying drivers of contemporary corruption and lawlessness in Central America. As France comes to terms with its colonial role in the 1994 Rwandan genocide, and Germany sets a high international bar with its apology for the 20th century genocide of the Herero and Nama people of Namibia, offering $1.35 billion as a gesture of goodwill. The U.S. needs to come to terms with its historic role in the Guatemalan genocide and Central American dictatorships. U.S. policies should not be driven by fears of governments representative of the majority population of the country. Central American elites seek to marginalize the majority poor in their countries by rallying U.S. support for corrupt governments in the name of stopping populism, always with reference to Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and Evo Morales in Ecuador. 
but it is this very political exclusion that endangers democracy by feeding populist movements of the right and left. U.S. policy should no longer be a pinata for the entrenched elites in Central America, who in the past increased their wealth and power in the name of anti-communism and then in the war on drugs. The drivers of violence and poverty in Central America are cartels, gangs, and organized crime working in concert with corrupt government officials in transnational criminal enterprises. We need a Marshall Plan for Central America, not a war on migration. Instead of supporting a politically motivated presidential commission in Guatemala and beefing up security forces in Central America and Mexico, the US government should work with the United Nations and the Organization of American States to establish a regional commission to expand upon the work of CICIG. The US and the European Union could provide leadership and resources to build a regional anti-corruption commission to address the transnational nature of this criminality. Unilateral US action, militarizing borders and supporting increased militarization in Central America is not a solution in the long term or the short term. Support for access to education, economic growth, expanding labor opportunities and enhancing democracy are the very benchmarks for successful international aid programs but they cannot flourish in corrupt Central American states. The United States and the European Union can help address the root causes of migration and reestablish democratic priorities of strengthening human rights, rule of law, and democracy by working with the United Nations and Organization of American States to reboot CICIG as an independent regional commission against impunity empowered to investigate and prosecute corruption and criminality in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. I so very much look forward to our conversation about these issues, and I thank you for your attention and for listening.